drugs cause the brain to adapt, to change, because they sledgehammer the brain with signals that nothing natural does in the same way. And once the brain adapts, if you remove the drug from it, you can feel very uncomfortable, you can no longer feel normal, and you want another dose of the drug to get you back into that state that you were before. That adaptation is what drives addiction for most people. And that's one of the most critical things to recognize. In some cases, it's irreversible. In some cases, it's re completely reversible. But above all, people who don't start never have to walk down that path. Welcome again to our seventh season of the John Salmon Hot Button School Conversations Discussion Series. My name is Mark Sokol. I'm the president and CEO here at JCC Greater Boston. This series uh, invites distinguished figures to engage in unique exchanges around controversial and sometimes very difficult topics. Our panelists are always led by expert moderators through respectful, thought-provoking discussions on s issues of concern to the Jewish community, the general community, and to our world. They offer insights into so many important and meaningful things. The hallmark of this series is civil, respectful dialogue and conversation. Tonight, we present another program that is both timely and touches nearly every corner of our community, America's opioid epidemic. The situation in Massachusetts is especially dire, with the fatal overdose rate more than double the national average and among the highest in the country. While the extent of the crisis is easy to see, the cause is harder to pinpoint. Our panel tonight will examine the origins of the worst public health crisis of the 21st century and expose the role of pharmaceutical companies played in pushing addictive opioids into the American market. They will look ahead to what needs to be done to stem the crisis. Finally, two things. Uh, Jonathan Seyman, for whom this series is named, was a leader with a unique ability to get people from different sides of an issue to sit together and to listen to each other. In this spirit, we ask that our audience please be respectful of all thoughts and all opinions shared by our panelists. As I always say, this is not a Red Sox-Yankees game. No cheering, no booing, and no popcorn. So once again, welcome to our panelists, welcome to our audience, and I'd like to turn things over to our moderator, Barry Mayer. Thanks to Mark and to everyone at the JCC for making this possible, and thanks to all of you as well for coming out tonight. Uh, as a personal aside, um, I consider this evening a success already, since the last time I was at a JCC was right after I was bar mitzvahed. And so it's a kind of a, a return to my roots uh, as well. So, uh, you know, we're here to talk about the opioid crisis. And, and we, we are hearing that term virtually everywhere, on television, radio, in newspapers. And you, it, it almost sounds simplistic when you hear the term opioid crisis. But it's a very complex situation. It's really kind of a hydra-headed one. It's a problem that involves not only prescription drugs, but illegal street drugs like fentanyl. And these, are, these drugs are the drugs that are driving the current uh, increase in overdose deaths. And, and because it is a complex problem, it's also a very complex, there are many complex issues involved with it. And, and those are some of the issues that I hope we're going to talk about tonight. And I, and I hope there's going to be, there, there will be things that you'll take away from this discussion as well. I mean, we're going to talk a little bit about how the, with our experts are going to describe how the, this crisis began and, and where we are today, what addiction is, the science of addiction, uh, what we can look for in our own homes and our family members uh, to understand the signs of addictions and, and ways to prevent that, and also deal with other aspects of the opioid crisis, which is how do we deal with people who are in pain? who are suffering from legitimate pain and, and the types of treatments that are either available to them or that are being restricted and, and not available 
to them. So I'd like to, uh, you know, also make the same point that Mark made, which is that I'm not a legislator, a regulator, a litigator, and I hope we can approach uh, this conversation in that same spirit, uh, that we're here to learn about an issue and hopefully take something away from it. And so with that, I'd like to just turn to all of you, and maybe we can start with a simple question of uh, how do we get here and where are we through your own particular lens? And since, uh, Rich, you were introduced first, why don't you take that on first? Oh, thank you. Uh, and thank you all uh, for, for having us. Uh, I think this is really important, particularly as a community. Um, you know, I, I became addicted to uh, heroin uh, quite young. I was around 15 years old. And, um, you know, it was new, it was just coming into, uh, you know, the Boston area, out by the suburbs in Brighton and, and uh, what I call the suburbs, but, um, and we didn't know. I mean, the, the thing that I think is the same today as it was then is that nobody knew what was about to happen. Um, opiates uh, are, are, um, are much more dangerous than people can think. Um, when, when I had taken my first uh, bag of heroin, uh, you know, that was it. It was utopia. Uh, I changed the way I felt, and uh, I never looked back. And, and it got worse, and the losses came, and the trouble came, and the incarcerations. My parents had no idea what was going on, you know. <clears throat> but there was hope. There were people out there. There were people out there working, you know, act, making those connections, responsible connections to recovery. And, um, you know, there was a lot of slipping and sliding and falling. And, and, and Dr. Dr. Madras, maybe you can jump in here and, and talk to us about that same question, but from the perspective of a research scientist, someone who's been following this. Oh, well, I've been following drugs since 1963 when I got my first um, collection of LSD from the CIA experiments. And I was asked to find out how they work. And the most important thing I took away from that experience, which carries me to this day, is that drugs cause the brain to adapt, to change, because they sledgehammer the brain with signals that nothing natural does in the same way. And once the brain adapts, if you remove the drug from it, you can feel very uncomfortable, you can no longer feel normal, and you want another dose of the drug to get you back into that state that you were before. That adaptation is what drives addiction for most people. And that's one of the most critical things to recognize. In some cases, it's irreversible. In some cases, it's re completely reversible. But above all, people who don't start never have to walk down that path. And, and Andrew, uh, you're sort of on the front lines dealing with people who are addicted to drugs, uh, trying to help them get off of drugs. So, you know, how, in the terms of your professional work, has the picture changed over the past decade for you? Yeah, and um, you had also started by asking how did, you know, how did we get here? Um, and, um, and to talk about how the picture changed and how, and how we got here, I, I think <clears throat> it's important to talk for a moment about where we actually are and, and what the opioid crisis really is. Because um, as you, you mentioned, we, we can't open up a, a newspaper without hearing about the opioid crisis. Um, it's on the radio, it's on, on television. And over and over again, we're hearing about the opioid crisis, but what, what is it? And I think it's important to understand that the, the opioid crisis is not a problem of drug abuse. This is not an epidemic of people taking dangerous drugs because it feels good and they're accidentally harming themselves. I think the opioid crisis is best understood as an epidemic of opioid addiction. And as uh, Dr. Madras mentioned, you know, once somebody becomes addicted to a drug, they need to keep using that drug to feel normal or to avoid feeling awful. And while some people did become opioid addicted, taking opioids because they liked the effect, many people became opioid addicted, taking opioids as prescribed by doctors. 
And what we're really dealing with when we talk about the opioid crisis, the array of health and social problems that, we're, that we define as the opioid crisis, I believe has been driven by a sharp increase in the number of people suffering from the condition of opioid addiction. And if you frame it that way as an epidemic of opioid addiction, then you'll understand that the reason we're experiencing record high levels of opioid overdose deaths, <laughs> the reason we're seeing heroin and fentanyl flood into non-urban communities, the reason we're seeing a soaring increase in infants born opioid dependent, children winding up in the foster care system, outbreaks of injection related infectious diseases, the driver behind all of these problems has been the increase in opioid well, addiction. We've, always, we've had addiction all along. You know, there's a history of addiction in this country. It tends to travel from drug to drug. Uh, certainly in this current crisis, the seeds were laid uh, through what was probably the over-marketing and over-prescribing of prescription painkillers. But there are other uh, factors that play into it. There's a recreational factor. A lot of people get into uh, drugs recreationally rather than through prescriptions. So why don't we talk a little bit about, maybe start with um, Dr. Madras, to expound a little bit on the process of addiction and then maybe Rick, you can follow up on how it feels as a person becoming addicted. People become addicted to drugs because of a combination of themselves who they are as a person, whether or not they have a psychiatric problem, whether or not they're stressed or anxious, whether or not they've suffered uh, childhood abuse, whether or not they've had many setbacks in life. So the personal is, is a factor that's very important. The environment is another factor that's critical. Who your friends are, who your influencers are, whether or not drugs are easily accessible, when I was deputy drug czar of the country, kids were doing farming parties, P-H-A-R-M-I-N-G. They would go into their parents' cabinets, medicine cabinets, raid them and put out a large glass bowl, dump all the pills they could find, and just pop them and figure out whether or not they liked them or not. So access, the environment is a critical one. And Obviously, the third is the drug itself. We know from a lot of studies, thousands of studies now, that drugs can produce changes in the brain that compel using and using over and over again. Well, how was your brain change? But I think we're talking about addiction. <laughs> yeah. And by definition, addiction means more. Um, and, um, you know, I didn't... Uh, wake up one morning and say, I can't wait to be a heroin addict and uh, end up uh, losing the love and affection of my family and being incarcerated. But what happened was uh, I started out with other drugs. And I think that's really important uh, for all of us as a community to know. I don't think people just wake up and become um, heroin addicts. Uh, you know, I, I think for, for me and for the friends and the people I hung around with, it was a slow process of you know, drinking on the weekends. I played hockey. We, you mm -hmm. know, I drank with the hockey team, and you know, and then we started smoking. Some well, what was the first thing though when you made that change? Because we all drank. We all I smoked yeah. when I was a kid, but you went the extra mile as it yeah. were. And, I and think what I, tipped you I over drank into and that? Marijuana, even yeah. at that point, yeah. for a different reason. I think you did it maybe to socialize. I did it to change the way I felt. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was, and I didn't know this was happening to me. This is only in hindsight. Mm -hmm. And so anything that could do that was, uh, was definitely for me. Mm -hmm. And heroin really ended up doing it to the point where, um, you know, it was like a euphoric um, marshmallow kind of really laid back. I mean, I could stand up on a corner, wait for my dealer, and just nod out. Right, right. And Andrew, you see people coming in all the time. And is... Is the type of person changing, or is the psychology of the person changing? Is there any change in the nature of the people that you've seen over these past 10 years? Yeah, so um, in my experience treating opioid addiction, um, I uh, treated, I mean, I, if I, I could roughly break up the patients I've treated into two groups, an older group and a younger group. Uh, the younger patients that I treated uh, became addicted to opioids 
either through recreational use, uh, mostly through non-medical recreational use, although some became addicted through medical use. They had serious medical problems, mm -hmm. and that's how they got hooked. Um, my older patients had become opioid addicted almost entirely through medical use. And when, when it comes to highly addictive drugs, like nicotine or, or heroin or hydrocodone or, or oxycodone, just about anyone who repeatedly uses the drug is going to be at risk of getting addicted. Opioids are not like alcohol. Uh, alcohol uh, can be a very serious problem for a significant subset of our population, but most of the population can be repeatedly exposed to alcohol and doesn't get addicted to it. About 10 percent become addicted. A lot more than 10 percent have risky drinking and health problems, but addiction occurs in about 10 percent of alcohol users. With the highly addictive drugs, the individual's characteristics become less important. They're, they're important, but less important. The drug's inherent addictive properties and the repeated exposure to the drug become more important. Yeah, you know, one of the things that, uh, when I first started reporting on this back in 2001, that, that long ago, uh, one of the things I was most struck by were calls I would get or people I would meet who had lost a child, a son or a daughter, to an overdose. Maybe they went to a farming party. You know, maybe they try a drug like Oxy for the first time. And, you know, these were, you know, I, I was shocked when I would hear these stories. The problem is now we're hearing these virtually every day. We're hearing about a kid getting addicted. We're hearing about a kid overdosing. Perhaps, you know, many of the people who were, who've come here tonight have had family members uh, that have become addicted, who have overdosed. And so, you know, from your experiences, and again, we'll, we'll start with you, Dr. Rogers, you know, what should one be looking for? I mean, you've got a son, you've got a daughter. What are the signs that someone might be drifting towards overusing or becoming addicted to a drug? Well, I think the most important thing for every parent to recognize is that the initiation of any drug is already a flag. Mm. If you're under 18 and you're using alcohol, you're smoking, you're using marijuana, that puts a child at tremendously high risk for progressing onto other drugs. We don't know why, but it seems as if drugs, they're very different, they have different effects in the brain, different targets, but most people who are addicted to opioids are polypharmacists. That means they, have, they use many drugs. And when people do post-mortem studies, they study what they died of. They don't find only one drug in them. They find alcohol, they find marijuana, they find benzodiazepines, cocaine. So what we have to recognize is that the use of any drug by a child whose brain has not fully developed is one sign. Their friends, who are their friends? Have they changed their friends? Are they becoming more secretive in the house? Do they tend to lock their doors more often, stay behind closed doors? Is the relationship with you getting different? Are they less open with you? Are they sleeping less? Are they spending a lot more time away from home? Are they on social networking sites more? There's a whole list of flags that every parent should be aware of. And, and, and Rick, you should be an expert on this, right? <laughs> well, not so on my what, own. So what do you, yeah, my own. It, what do you know to look familiar? for? Yeah, it, you know, not on my own experience, but I have six children, and I have three children in recovery, responsible recovery. And um, I went through this with them, and I wasn't exempt from from those signposts, and, and I also wasn't exempt from the denial that comes with this. You know, I didn't want to believe that my son was doing something or my daughter was doing something. And, and, and I'm on the front line with this stuff every day. And, um, but it was the door, you know, not coming out of your room, sleeping. Sleeping to two o'clock. Yeah. You know, the friends sneaking out at night. The coming in and not wanting to talk. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of signposts, and a lot of this stuff you can get online. Um, you, you know, I know um, 
the Massachusetts Addic uh, uh, Organization of Addiction Recovery more has a number of uh, uh, um, links to sites like this that you can actually go on because I think it's important in how to confront a son or a daughter and, and when to do that and how to do it professionally. Um, there, there was a, uh, there's a character in the book I wrote, an actual yeah. person, a, a mother. Now her daughter was like, stone, became a stone cold oxy addict. She was stealing from the family, mm -hmm. she was falling apart, and the mother, as many mothers are, or parents are, was in total denial. Uh, so Andrew, when you're dealing with families, which I take it you are in your practice as well, how do you deal with that aspect of things? Having to have them confront what a relative may be going through. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I totally understand your, your question, but an important point here uh, is that, because I think when you're asking this question and, and the answers you got, which I agree with and I thought they were very good answers, um, I, it sounds like you're, th this question about, you know, how do you recognize uh, when there's a problem and, right. and what should you do uh, about it when you, and how do you confront that individual? Typically that uh, discussion is um, focused on parents and what to do about their kids. And it's really important to recognize that it, this is not just parents worrying about their kids, but seniors are another group that have been hit very hard. And there are a lot of a, adults who need to be concerned about their, their parents. And how do you as, deal with that as, how, as if you're well. confronted it, by that? It can be very difficult. It's easier when it's a young person and it's illicit drugs. Mm -hmm. um, it's much harder if it's an older person and they're receiving prescriptions from, from a physician. Often the individual who may be addicted to the prescription um, will have a harder time accepting that they're suffering from addiction because they're, they're receiving a legitimate prescription from a doctor. Um, and they may even be taking it as prescribed. We might still consider them addicted because they actually look in many ways like the people who we've just heard about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they're having a decrease in the quality of their life. They're no longer engaged in, in family. They're on the sofa all day long. Um, and so it, it can be very challenging uh, in, in trying to, to help people. And the other thing, I, the other messages I would just have are that if you suspect that there's a problem, there, and that there probably is a, a problem and you should act on that concern. How do you, what do you do? It, I, I'd say my advice to, to answer your question would be to try and engage that person as empathically as you possibly can. You let them know that you love them. They're going to be very likely feel ashamed about having this problem um, because of the stigma of, of addiction and, and to, to let them know that you want to help them and, and support them and, um, and that you're there for them, I think is probably the most critical thing. So, so you, you're all very empathic and I think compassion in both the treatment of addiction and the treatment of pain are, are sort of important guideposts going forward. And so for, again, for each of you, we're here at this moment, we're confronted with an epidemic. What would each of you like to start see happening? How do we start working our way out of this? You mean at a national or local level? Either one, because <laughs> I, I think it has to happen on both levels. And sometimes I think it has to happen on the local level. What does a community like this need to do? Let's not wait for Washington to act. Okay. What do people on the local level do? So there are three areas that absolutely need help in this country. One is prevention. And prevention has a many, many, many faceted solutions. One is reducing unnecessary prescriptions. One is preventing children from initiating drugs because you can never predict, no parent has a crystal ball that will predict whether or not that child is going to start with marijuana or alcohol and then progress straight mainline either to heroin or to prescription opioids or to cocaine. Prevention is critical. We also have to educate in our communities the most simple fundamental things. I've given, last year I gave 70 presentations on the Opioid Commission 
many of them to audiences that were not in the field. And I would say, here is a list of drugs. How many of you know these are opioids? And half the audience didn't know that every single drug I listed, there were over 25, were opioids. And I said, every single one of those goes to the same target in the brain that promotes addiction and that can kill you. And you should be aware of that information. And someone should be telling you this. Somebody should also be telling the community that a pill that is not bought in a drugstore could be a fake pill. There are pill presses being made in China. They are imported here. The logos for the pills are very well known and easy to reproduce. And these pills have fentanyl. Somebody I know, Eric Bowling's son, got one on the campus of the University of Colorado because he was anxious and his friend said, here, here's a little tranquilizer that will help you sleep in your first week in college. It had fentanyl and he died within an hour. There are so many ways in which prevention is critical. I won't take up all the time, but I'll get to intervention and treatment later. All right. So, Rick, <laughs> your, your, your turn. What would you like to see? Well, I'm going to pick up where she yeah. <laughs> left off is uh, <clears throat> intervention and prevention. Um, uh, there are ways today to intervene. And, yeah, to describe what those terms mean. Uh, intervention is, you know, where whether you're a parent or, or, or um, in, in the community we have now diversion programs, we have set up uh, prevention programs to be in the schools, in the high schools, and uh, we're trying to get down into the middle schools just to educate and to bring, raise the level of awareness as to actually what we're, de what we're dealing with and where we're going with this. You know, whether you become uh, addicted to opiates in the end run or, or immediately, there's a lot of other things that happen to particularly children before that. Um, my whole thing is addiction is, um, whether it's opiates, whether it's marijuana or alcohol, you know, does it make your life unmanageable? Does it take away from you the opportunity to be all you can be? And that's where interve intervention has to come in. And you can do it on a family level, and there's plenty of people out there that do it. We have, in our recovery coaches in the law office, we, uh, they are interventionists too. And they'll educate, they'll sit with the parents before they'll intervene with the individual. And then they put a plan together to do that. And, and um, what, you? what should we do about the opioid crisis? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, Try to keep it simple. I, I, no, I, I can, because I, I really do think there is a simple answer to that uh, question. The solutions are complex. It's a, it's a difficult problem to tackle. But the big picture strategies for, for dealing with the opioid crisis, I think, are very straightforward. And you know, if you understand that the opioid crisis is an epidemic of opioid addiction, what we need to do about this epidemic of opioid addiction is similar to what we would need to do about any disease epidemic. Think even about an Ebola outbreak. What would you do about an Ebola outbreak? Um, the strategies would be to contain it, meaning prevent new people from getting the Ebola infection, and to see that the people who have the Ebola Affection. The people who have the Ebola infection are receiving life-saving treatment so it doesn't kill them. What we need to do about the opioid crisis is, is really the same. We have to prevent more Americans from becoming opioid addicted, really reduce the incidence of opioid addiction. How, but how do you do that? It's so complicated. More than anything else, to re prevent people from becoming opioid addicted, I agree with what, what's been said, but I think the single most important strategy for preventing opioid addiction is to promote much more cautious prescribing so that doctors don't directly cause addiction in our patients and so that we don't indirectly cause addiction. Well, that, that leads by us into another, uh, to another area uh, that I want to touch on with all of you, and that is the treatment of pain. Uh, pain is a significant problem. Uh, there are people that suffer from severe, long lasting pain. Uh, many of them say that they are in some ways the victim of the crackdown on uh, uh, painkiller prescribing. So how do we sort of balance those problems, address those problems? Well, 
I think the most important thing is to, as Andrew said, to prescribe very cautiously. Because, for example, in the past and still in the present, um, Governor Baker was with me and complaining to me a little while ago that somebody told him a dentist was still prescribing 60 or 90 Percocets for a tooth extraction, which takes one or two days for the pain to disappear. There is still too much prescribing of opioids, and I think that that is a major problem. I think the, so we have to be very judicious on whether or not the pain merits the opioid, because there are so many alternatives to opioids in terms of dealing with pain. For example, a study was just done showing that uh, ibuprofen or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are just as effective as opioids in relieving knee pain, lower back pain, joint pain, the most common causes of pain that and until very recently someone just wrote a script for opioids, it obviously was completely unnecessary. We have to find alternatives. There's research now at, at uh, the NIH, that the National Institutes of Health, that is trying to find alternatives to opioids. But we already have many alternatives to opioids mm -hmm. for pain relief, unless it's severe, intractable, end stage. You know, there are many caveats mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. There's some times when only opioids will do. Rick? I agree. And, you know, thank you for your efforts. And, trying to reduce the number of um, um, opiates uh, in the marketplace, uh, and there are alternatives. Yeah. I know there are alternatives. Uh, personally, uh, I cannot take opiates. Well, you're, uh, you're ruled out at this point. Uh, no, but, yeah, yeah, I mean, I just would never do it because I never would want to trigger my, right. uh, you know, my addiction. So uh, I have to look for alternative pain. Uh, 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 mm -hmm medication, and, uh, and I do, and it's available. My son had major surgery, uh, and he, he is recovered from uh, opiates, from uh, oxycodone, and, and he had uh, blockers. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting to me, because for him to get that prescription to Beth Israel Hospital, they didn't have it, and they had to wait for permission to use it. I think there's a lot more stuff available Yes. that we're not really, that they're not using, that they could use. Yes. And, and Andrew, you were mentioning about older patients who have become uh, dependent, addicted on opioids through long-term medical use. Is there a point or is there some argument to be made that if that person is doing okay, let's just let them, and that, and that drug is helping them with their pain, Let's just leave it be, or where does the in intervention start when you're dealing with an older well, patient? Well, older patient or middle-aged people, um, uh, the, the fact that they may be doing okay on opioids, there, you know, there are many people who are put on opioids, uh, they're taking them around the clock, and, and they're not doing well. Um, and there's um, really good reason to believe that opioids are not going to be effective for long-term use because of tolerance to the pain relieving effect, which would mean that to, in order to, to continue getting pain relief, you need higher and higher uh, doses. Um, the fact that there are people who could be on opioids long term and seem to do OK is not surprising, because that's the basis for treating opioid addiction with opioids. There are people who can take opioids and, and do OK. That's very different from saying that they're continuing to get pain relief. There are many people on long term round the clock opioids who are convinced they're getting pain relief. They will tell you that they're getting pain relief and they're not lying. Uh, but the, what they're probably experiencing when they take the opioid is the relief of the withdrawal pain or the relief of pain hypersensitivity. Because when opioids are wearing off or when you're going into withdrawal, everything hurts. But especially if you have a reason, a chronic medical problem, that pain problem is going to be much worse. So these individuals take the opioid, the pain is relieved, and they can be convinced that the opioid is helping them. As far as how to handle this population, 
Um, and you could take people with conditions like fibromyalgia or low back pain with a normal spine or chronic headache. Three of the most common reasons are people are on long-term opioids. The medical community is now recognizing that we shouldn't have put so many people on long-term opioids for these conditions, um, that it's more likely to harm the patient than help them. That doesn't mean, though, that we should force these people off rapidly. Many of these people may not be able to come off of opioids. Um, some of them, if they're on dangerously high doses, I think even if they don't like it, if it's a really dangerous dose, a doctor's not going to want to keep giving it to them. Um, so I think some of these people we can maybe manage on the opioids that they're on. Some of them we can help come off. It's a lot of work. If you can get them completely off of their opioids, often they have a significant, I know you're aware of this because you, you wrote a book on the topic, they, they often have a significant improvement if you can get them completely off of their opioids, but many can't do that, and so we have to really work with them. And yes, some of them, even though I think they may be doing well despite being on an opioid, not because of the opioid, um, I think some of them maybe we, we really should leave them on that opioid if it's a modest well, dose. When we talk about alternatives, uh, and I'm going to veer off a little mm. bit here, something we were talking about over dinner, uh, medical marijuana has often been raised as an alternative pain treatment to opioids. Uh, it's also being raised as a drug that should be legalized. Uh, and there are some people that claim that if we legalize marijuana, we're going to reduce the opioid problem because people will start smoking pot instead of taking opioids. But what do we know right now, pros and cons, about marijuana, its benefits, its risks, or are we are in trying to solve one problem, are we about to open another Pandora's box? Well, the most recent data says that people, there's a few longitudinal studies. What that means is you follow people for one to four years rather than just interviewing them and saying, does marijuana help you? And they'll say, oh, yes, I've stopped using opioids. A longitudinal study means you follow that same person over a number of years, and in these cases, there are a few very good studies that have been done that have shown that people do not reduce their opioids and their pain does not get better if they top off the tank with marijuana and they are more likely to develop a marijuana use disorder, they are more likely to have an opioid use disorder and they're less likely to stay in treatment for opioid use disorder. So at this point, there are, there's one study that came out a few years ago that said states where marijuana has been legalized as, as a uh, so-called medicine, those states have lower overdoses. But that is a completely, um, from the point of view of statistics and scholarly look, that is just not the way you do it. You have to follow the individual, not the state level. And since that study came out, another one came out in probably the most prestigious science magazine saying that the states that have legal marijuana, the opioid overdoses, in fact, have increased. So at this point, one has to say that the evidence is not in favor of and when you say medical marijuana, I don't know what that means. Is it 90%, is it 10%, is it THC, is it Hindu Kush, is it blue purple smoke? There is. You, you know what it means. <laughs> no, I, there's no stand, I mean, this is not an approved drug. There are no randomized controlled trials. This it does not come close to what FDA standards would require for putting the signature of a, of a large body of professionals in, in, in endorsing. And Rick, are you seeing sort of with a, I mean, the marijuana that's out here today is much more powerful 
than the marijuana I remember encountering. Uh, and, and what impact is that having? Well, it, it's having a big impact. First of all, um, my question always is, um, you know, we have legalized um, tobacco, we have legalized gambling, we have legalized alcohol, uh, we have legalized pornography. Uh, how's that working out for us? <laughs> I mean, um, this is just another drug in the, in the treasure chest of, of things to use, abuse, and become addicted to. My wife is 15 years in recovery from marijuana. And, um, you know, her stories are no different than the stories of, you know, my son who was addicted to oxycodone, my, you know, and, and people addicted to alcohol. <clears throat> Addiction takes away, it robs you of the opportunity to be who you can, to be a good son, a good brother, you know, a good <clears throat> parent. Uh, and that's what it's really about. Whether you're addicted to marijuana or oxycodone, I mean, if it takes away from your life, this is something that needs to be prevented. And it's best prevented early on. I mean, that's what we're finding out. You know, raise your hand. Tell us. Right. And, Andrew, in, in your treatment, how is it playing out? Just, um, well, you know, it, it's interesting because um, both sides of the marijuana debate are trying to use the opioid crisis. So the... The pro-marijuana folks are saying that marijuana is the answer to the opioid crisis, and uh, folks opposed to marijuana will say are saying that it would make the opioid crisis worse because it's a, the argument is that it would be a gateway drug and more people would wind up ultimately on on heroin. Um, I my own view is that um, I don't believe it would make the opioid crisis better or worse. I see it as uh, its own separate problem. Um, I have serious concerns that with an industry promoting use because of a financial incentive uh, through legalization, um, we would see we would see, and I think there's evidence we're already seeing a sharp increase in use. And there, you know, marijuana is less addictive than opioids, but as more people use it, you're basically creating another drug industry. Yeah, more people is what are going to get uh, would get addicted to right. it, and although. Marijuana addiction doesn't kill people the way opioid addiction kills people. It can really mess people mm. up. So I don't see it as helping or hurting the opioid crisis. I see it as its own separate problem. One thing I would say, though, is if I was treating a patient with severe, chronic, intractable pain who was really suffering and had tried everything, mm. I would sooner consider marijuana for that patient than heroin. And when we prescribe opioids, we're basically trying heroin on that patient because the effects produced by oxycodone and hydrocodone are really indistinguishable from the effects produced by... I was out in Ohio a couple of, maybe six months ago, uh, giving a talk at a university, and uh, for all of, you, all of you who are not aware of this, Ohio really is the epicenter of the uh, opioid crisis in our country. I believe one out of every six deaths nationwide takes place in Ohio. And, and they're just being brutalized by the, it, it's at the point where, um, you know, when people have overdoses, they can be rescued from that overdose with a drug called Narcan, and the, the cops carry it, and EMTs carry it, and firefighters carry it, and, and they've gotten to the point where um, they don't even want to revive people anymore, because they keep coming back and reviving the same person four times. A week, and, and they were very interested in knowing what they could do in their community, like basic grassroots efforts that people there and people here can take. I have some ideas, but I'm going <laughs> to turn it over to you guys first to see what your ideas are. Well, <clears throat> the uh, police station in Gloucester that that uh, is an open house for people who want to get treatment is, is I think, one of the most interesting uh, models for what people can do, the grassroots movement. There is a, a fellow at uh, Boston University, professor, who is beginning to c copy the model in about 300 places throughout the country where people go to police stations and say, I've got a problem with opioids and can you help me? 
and they immediately try to get them onto medications that is going to get them off the dangerous drugs of unknown quantities, whether or not they're laced with fentanyl, and also get them into, uh, uh, into treatment. I think that we have to do a lot more. We have to revolutionize our entire system of treatment for opioids. I think every single hospital in the nation should have an addiction center that deals with substance abuse, substance use disorders. And they should have specialists that, are, that include psychiatrists, addiction medicine, uh, people who are behavioral health specialists, recovery coaches, and so on. There should be a safe place where people can go and begin to get help on demand. If you go to an emergency room, you'll be treated. If you have an addiction and you show up somewhere and say, I need help, there's not anywhere in the country where it's automatic that you will have help on the spot, except in a few places in Massachusetts and a few other states. And I think we have to revolutionize the entire system of addiction treatment using that kind of model of an integrated model that every single community hospital, health centers has a place, a safe place for someone to go. What would you like to see happen here? Oh, I come in this to, town. Yeah, no, I, town. I'm, I'm, well, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't differ with the doctor, but I'm an uh, abstinence-based uh, person in recovery. And I'm not alone. I mean, there's, you know, uh, uh, tons of people that I know. I could fill Fenway Park up with the people. Because uh, we had no choice back then, too. There wasn't a lot of uh, uh, other pathways uh, to recovery. Um, and, and, you know, I, I really push that even if it is under medication-assisted treatment and people are on medication-assisted treatment because I really want them to have what I have. Um, you know, I, I, I woke up and there was the gift, the greatest gift of all, which was life. And, Andrew, what... what, what steps here in this town, Needham, or in Waltham, or in, in, in wherever, small community, what could people at this grassroots level yeah, be well, doing? Well, actually, there's a lot being done at the local level across the country. Many counties across the United States have a, have a task force to address the opioid crisis with, with membership on that task force from the medical community, from, from law enforcement, from, from policymakers. And I'm seeing across the country uh, where I, places where I visited really good work being done. I think the bigger problem is that we haven't really seen the help uh, needed from the federal government. And I don't think local communities can do this on their own. They need help from the federal government, the resources, maybe money from from a settlement against uh, Purdue Pharma and other drug companies could be used. Um, but th this is a very expensive problem to create the kind of system that Bertha was just uh, describing. And I can tell you that under the Obama administration, uh, there was almost total neglect of the opioid crisis until very late in President right. Obama's right. term. Under the Trump administration, there's uh, been a lot more attention paid to the, to the problem um, but we still aren't seeing what I think we really need, which is um, a commitment to long-term funding and the resources we need to build out the treatment system that Bertha just described. Now, before I get to a final question, I'm going to ask me, Barry, what would you like to see? What would help towns like this, communities like this? I think that people, the type of people People like you who have come here tonight can play a tremendous role in, in reshaping uh, this crisis. And it can be very simple. It can be from the standpoint of going to your employer, or if you are an employer, uh, making sure that the insurer, the person that's providing you or your employees with health care, provides them the best possible pain treatment provides them an array of pain treatment. And walking away from that insurer, I mean, part of this problem was caused by the insurance industry. 
by their realization that they could make the biggest profits by simply just approving uh, the prescription of pain pills, not approving any kinds of other treatments for patients. So that would be a major step that businesses and employers and, and just individual employees could make in trying to kind of turn this ship around. So as we move into the future, we're doing it on the basis of better, more scientifically sound treatments than the types of treatments that got us here into the dilemma that we now face. So I've said my bit. Now, we'll let you all play king or, and queen for a day. There's all this litigation going on. Uh, Purdue Pharma has already paid up or agreed to pay $270 million to Oklahoma. Uh, there may be billions that come out of these lawsuits. A certain chunk of it obviously is gonna go into the pocket of lawyers, but presuming that there's something left over, how would you like to see that money spent? I'd like to see it spent three ways. <clears throat> Number one, as Dr. Kolodny said, we have to help the people who currently have a problem. And I'd like to see a much, much better, much better treatment center services than we have. We have 14,000 treatment centers in the country. About a third of them offer help with regard to medications for opioids. Very few of them offer psychiatric services. Very few of them offer anything close to what are called principles of evidence-based treatment. And I think either the federal government, which, which subsidizes many of them, just literally closes them down and starts all over again. The way, the model that I really like, which is completely integrated within a safe medical healthcare system. We've got to do that. We have to work on prevention. Um, prevention of young people, we have to work on prevention of supply. Those of you who are here who haven't really heard the word fentanyl, be aware that fentanyl is now the number one reason why people are dying in the, in the country. And those, this fentanyl is not prescription opioids. We haven't even touched on this. The vast majority of fentanyl is being made in China. It is being shipped to Canada or to Mexico, and from there, or directly to the United States, and that's what's killing most of the people in Massachusetts right now, over 80%. When I served in office, we had a fentanyl crisis in 2006, and we developed a rapid response team to figure out what was happening. What we found out was that there's one lab in Mexico, in Toluca, Mexico, that was producing all the fentanyl. And then when that lab was taken out, the overdose deaths went to near zero due to fentanyl. We still have the prescription. So there are many, many problems that we face, but prevention, intervention, treatment, mm -hmm. evidence-based, rigorous, decent quality treatment, all of these are essential. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> um, what Bertha's talking about is, is, is really a hope uh, uh, that we all have. And I think with this type of advocacy too, uh, we will see the day when that happens. But it also takes a community like us to be able to do that. We need to, you know, when people are reintegrating themselves back into a community, especially from addiction issues, uh, or abuse issues or, or, or something, it, it really is on us to, to accept those people and to be able to work with them in jobs and housing and education, you know. Uh, so I, we can do this, as I say, addiction may not be a choice, but recovery is, in that we do recover better together as a community. I know that for a fact, as I sit here today. But I really believe in the holistic approach, and uh, I, I believe we are going to see that in the future with this kind of uh, push. 
<laughs> Andrew, you have a million dollars, a billion dollars, excuse me. How would you spend that? Well, you know, I uh, think that we need to tackle the opioid crisis by preventing opioid addiction and treating people who are already addicted. We've talked about the need for a new system. Uh, we want to make sure that people who are opioid addicted can more easily access the most effective treatment for their addiction, more easily access treatment than heroin, fentanyl, or prescription opioids. Someone who's opioid addicted, when they wake up in the morning, they're going to be feeling pretty sick. And they know they're going to need to use. And if they've got 10 bucks in their pocket, mm -hmm. and they know where they can buy a bag of dope, that's what they're going to do. And if finding a doctor or getting treatment for their addiction is expensive and difficult, they're just going to keep using. So, But really, um, the other thing I would do with this money um, is I think this money, settlement money or judgment money, if any of these cases go all the way in front of a, a jury, I think that a significant portion of that money needs to be used to correct the record. Um, so you, know, you mentioned insurance companies, and I think they were part of the problem. It was too easy to write an opioid prescription. Um, but really, the reason we're in the midst of a severe epidemic of opioid addiction is because of massive overprescribing. As the prescribing went up, millions of Americans became opioid addicted. And the reason the prescribing took off is because the medical community was responding to a brilliant, multifaceted campaign that minimized the risks of opioids, especially the risk of addiction, exaggerated the benefits of long-term use. And it wasn't just doctors hearing these messages from attractive sales reps working for Purdue Pharma. If it was just the sales reps, we would have been less gullible. We were hearing these messages from pain specialists eminent in the field of pain medicine, from professional societies. So you're from thinking hospitals. about in, spending some money on an educational Count, campaign, counter, or how would you address that? We, we've got to get to a medical community uh, that has been very seriously misinformed and that continues to overprescribe. We have to get them accurate information about the risks and benefits of these medications. So in the Opioid Commission, there were 56 recommendations. Mm -hmm. And, tw and because I wrote a significant piece of it, I'm quite familiar with it, 26 of them were to reverse engineer the mistakes of the past, which includes pain as a fifth vital sign, uh, press gainy scores, value-based purchasing, all of the things, uh, mental health parity, um, medical education, and uh, pain management education, and so on. So many of what you've recommended were in that commission report. This is an interesting question uh, that I'll let you all take a crack at, because it's not opioid per se, but it's about drug abuse. And it's about a story that I've read a couple of stories about, uh, which is um, there's a drug called gabapentin. And a gabapentin, I believe, is an anti-seizure medication. It's been approved for anti-seizure use, but also was prescribed off-label, if I'm correct, as a tranquilizer. Uh, it's very good if you have fear of flying. I can tell you that from personal experience. Um, but uh, it's also become quite a big recreational uh, drug on college campuses. And so, um, the question is, you know, how did gabapentin become such a widely prescribed drug of abuse or a drug that's being abused outside the medical setting? And what can be done to address this? Well, the, the reason uh, I think it's pretty clear um, why it was so uh, prescribed, um, Pfizer illegally marketed uh, <laughs> Neurant and gabapentin, and uh, was even found guilty of criminal charges for the off-label marketing of, of Neurant and, and paid an enormous settlement in the hundreds of millions of dollars for promoting an anticonvulsant, a drug that was really indicated for treating seizure disorder, for promoting it for sleep, anxiety, and every possible condition. So, um, and even though they paid that fine, I believe they probably still did better financially mm -hmm. for having promoted uh, the drug Im improperly. And so the, the drug does have some abuse potential, significant abuse potential. People ta who take it, will they feel a sedative, sedative effect uh, from it. 
Um, and um, so yes, it is. it does have street value and is particularly popular among people who might be struggling with opioid addiction mm. um, because it um, may relieve some of the anxiety that you experience when you're before your next dose of an opioid. Okay. Um, you know, one of the uh, areas that I always struggled with when I was reporting about opioids uh, is that there's very little scientific data. Uh, in fact, uh, most people aren't familiar with it, but the fact that when the, the drug OxyContin was approved by the FDA, there were no long-term studies about whether this drug was effective over the long term or what the consequences of using it over the long term might be. And, and this is a problem that is not uh, simply limited to OxyContin. It, it, it affects a lot, of, uh, a lot of opioid information. So the, the question is, you know, what are the data gaps concerning epidemiology, evidence-based interventions, that is, how does one type of treatment, say for back pain and opioid, compare to um, acupuncture or uh, biofeedback or exercise? How do we weigh these various competing uh, treatments and what evidence is there to support those measurements? First, I'll begin with an indirect answer, and then I'll yeah. go to the direct. The indirect answer is that Governor Baker today sent a letter to the Food and Drug Administration telling them that they have to relabel opioids in the packet insert to say that the evidence for long-term use doesn't exist, and these really have been approved only for short-term use. So kudos to our governor for doing that, absolutely. Um, the, the evidence is so thin on long-term use, and it remains that way. And one of the worst things that we did, I think, with, the, with our Food and Drug Administration was for something as powerful as opioids, which we've known about, that they're addictive and they can kill you, we've known about it for 200 years, was not imposing side-by-side -side comparisons with alternatives before approval. So we now are beginning to see side-by-side -side comparisons with alternatives. There are some alternatives where the evidence is pretty good, like physiotherapy, exercise therapy, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen, but there still has to be, in terms of long-term use, we need much better data with regard to uh, this class of drugs. Um, anyone else want to weigh in on that? Not me. <laughs> I, 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 uh, so you were, you know, you're asking about different treatments and, and yeah, how do we compare? Yeah, which... but I, you know, I think the critical point is that when you're talking about a dangerous treatment. Um, you really want evidence that it's going to help people. Treatment decisions are based on weighing risk versus benefit. And when it comes to you know, opioids, as Bertha just mentioned, we're lacking evidence that this is helpful when taken long term. But we have overwhelming evidence that it's dangerous, and the higher the dose, the more dangerous it is. And if you think about any medical intervention, whether it's a surgical intervention or, or a medicine, if you don't have good evidence that that treatment is going to help a patient, but you have very good evidence that it's dangerous, those are treatments we should prescribe rarely. Un unfortunately, opioids continue to be routinely prescribed mm -hmm. for conditions where we're lacking that evidence of effectiveness. So, you know, along with the, the opioid, prescription opioid problem, Bertha and the rest of you have mentioned the other face of the opioid crisis, which is the traffic and growing traffic in illegal opioids, counterfeit mm. opioids like fentanyl that are coming in from places like China and Mexico. Uh, and they, as we know, unfortunately, are now the biggest driver in the growing numbers of overdose deaths. And so the question wants to know, 
what is the government doing to control this black market? Yeah. So when, when, we, when the lab in Toluca, Mexico was taken out, that was simple. Because yes. that was the, there were some sources in California, but the Mexican lab was the major source. Currently, there are multiple sources from China that are coming in through multiple venues. The US Postal Service does not have a tracking system like FedEx does or UPS. So the Postal Service now has been commissioned to develop a tracking system so that's, that packages that come from China have to have an, a, a point of origin. There are many, many pressure points. Today, one of the ministers in China just agreed to schedule, meaning put into a restrictive schedule, all fentanyls. Many people are unaware that one, fentanyl can be made into a thousand different variants. And the chi and and you know when when fentanyl is scheduled, you can make a car fentanyl or mm -hmm. a furanyl fentanyl, butyryl fentanyl, and so on. So the Chinese today, and I believe this is pressure from the U.S. government, the State Department, and from the White House itself, to for the Chinese to put a restriction on every possible variant of fentanyl. Now. That's a first step. We've tried to extradite the five major chemis, chemical manufacturers in China. The Chinese refused to let them come to the US to face trial. But the fact that they have restricted fentanyl is a first step. I wait with bated breath to see whether or not they're actually going to impose the law on their own chemists. And it's basically a law enforcement problem. Right. I mean, it's not, it's not a problem that can be dealt with in the medical setting. This is basically it's having, in, you know, interdicting these drugs yep. or these starting materials, starting chemicals yep. for the drugs um, in, uh, before they get here. Before they get here. May I? Yeah. Uh, Charlie Baker, under the new criminal justice reform bill, uh, had strengthened the penalties on fentanyl and the distribution of fentanyl. Um, in one month, uh, I, I do court-appointed work. In one month, I had two cases totaling eight kilos of fentanyl in the mass turnpike. Eight. Eight. Four and four. Wow. And I stood at the cases for bail only. Eight. Because they were also illegal, and they were going to probably be deported at some point. But the, the number, the amount of fentanyl that's still coming into this country has to be stopped. It does make a difference, as you were saying, that, you know, every time I saw, you know, one of these guys, and I have to represent him, I'm a defense lawyer, and, you know, I do it, but, you know, I, I also, my advocacy is with the street addict and the person looking to connect to recovery. And I'm looking at the, this, and I'm saying, you know, this is going to kill so many people. Yeah. So one kilo will kill a half a million people. So eight kilos, do the math, yeah. four million. A month, just in the one month that I was in that court. Yeah. So there are uh, some people who believe, and you know, there are uh, questions about an issue related to pain patients who are you know, not being given alternative therapies. It's not available to them either. They live in places where it's not available, not accessible, uh, or they can't find doctors who provide it. You know, there, there are people out there who feel uh, that they've been abandoned, much in the way that addicts feel they've been abandoned. So how do we address those people? How do the, we... You know, the, the, there's a problem with the way you've just framed that question. Well, I don't think there's a problem is, with the way I've framed it. There, I really, you know, it's I've, a I've, problem with the way I've, you might want to answer well, it. Well, there, there, well I mean, I, I've been treating opioid addiction yeah. for more than 15 years, yeah. and I've never once met an addict. I've met people who refer to themselves as addicts, 
but I've never met an addict. Um, if by addict, uh, we're talking about people who are continuing to use and don't care who they hurt because they're having so much pleasure using opioids. Um, what I've treated are people suffering from opioid addiction. Some who became addicted because they, it was pleasurable and that's how they got hooked. Some who became addicted through, through medical treatment. And when, we, when you use the term addict, um, it, to me, um, it, it, it's not just stigmatizing because you're defining somebody with, with, with this disease, like, like calling somebody with schizophrenia schizophrenic. I think it is, I, I don't like that either. But with a, calling someone with addiction an addict, in my opinion, is even worse because I think it's very misleading. And so to, to ask your question about, well, there are the addicts who feel abandoned and the pain patients who feel abandoned is already accepting really what, what the Sacklers were trying to promote and their framework of the opioid crisis you Which know, is I, I think, with all due respect, that's ridiculous. Well, let, let me finish my... Let uh, me finish my you know, we, you, yeah. uh, you agree with yeah. me. I mean, addiction, substance abuse, and opiates is, is not... doesn't have a monopoly on addiction. Right. You know, people are addicted, uh, you know, by nature to obsessive compulsive behavior, whatever it is. And we don't know the answers to all of those. And those are challenges. And I understand the opiate crisis, uh, but I've never met an opiate addict that didn't use heroin... Um, suboxone, methadone, um, uh, gabapentin, um, and I deal with these guys every day in the courthouse, and uh, it, it's an array. Of, you, you didn't meet my. You didn't meet my. You know, I've always, the guys I've always, I've always believed that people who have the disease of addiction and people who have pain need to be treated compassionately. I've always approached that as a reporter. I've always believed that as a person. I believe okay. there, I believe there's, let me finish, there should be a compassionate treatment for people who struggle with substance abuse, and there should be compassionate treatment for people who have pain. And the only question I'm asking is, ha, and you cannot I, I choose to answer it if you want, I, I want to how do you question, deal with your, people you, who are not getting the pain the treatment problem, they need? The problem with your question, and you're continuing to do this, is your acting as if it's not possible for someone to have both addiction and pain. Many of the people I I'm treated, not acting that way at all. The, you, you, you are, you're saying that there are the addicts and the pain patients. I'm not trying to you're separate asking that. You're asking the question as if we no. have these distinct no. groups and we no. really, we, we don't necessarily have distinct groups. There are many people who've become opioid addicted, some because they took it because they liked the effect, some because they were suffering from from chronic pain, well, and so of course, of course, people who are who are opioid dependent, whether they wound up stuck on opioids because they did it because they liked the effect, or they wound up stuck on opioids because a doctor prescribed it to them, we need to help that population. I'm, we need I'm a not going to litigate approach. this with you. I'm going <laughs> to ask Bertha <laughs> yeah. to answer the question in any well, way she wants in terms of like well, how do you know? You're I'm trying to. So pose a question think, that one of the audience members is asking. I think one of the most important things we have to remember is about 90 million people in the country currently are prescribed opioids. And probably 10% of those have trouble in terms of compulsive use and so on and so forth. So the vast majority of people who are prescribed opioids for acute pain, for post-surgical pain, are not in trouble. What we are worried about are the people who got the opioids either through legitimate prescriptions or through diversion, taking the 50% of the people in the country who are misusing them, take them free from friends and family or buy them. It's that population that we have to worry about. And my feeling is that that population is susceptible for a number of reasons that have to be dealt with. They are susceptible because people who have opioid use disorder, there's a much higher incidence of pain in them. They have much higher incidence of anxiety, much higher incidence mm. of stress much higher incidence of psychiatric comorbidity. So there is, some people get addicted 
I think you're a poster child because the drug literally changed your brain. But there are some people who have so many confounds, and I think that those people have to be treated with much, much more subtlety and much more integrated approaches to all the problems they have, rather than just pain or right, this. Right. That, I think, would be my answer. Good. So I thought we'd end on a kumbaya moment. <laughs> uh, we didn't, but nonetheless, thank you all very much for coming tonight. Uh, I hope that it was time well spent and that you'll take something back and, and, and factor it into your lives going forward. Round of applause for our panelists. Yeah. Um, I want to I uh, formally thank uh, all of you for giving us education and giving us information and giving us stimulating questions and issues to think about. But most of all, um, we are at a Jewish community center. And I'd like to end on the thought uh, and uh, Bertha, you said this to, uh, to Rick when we were having dinner. Yes. You, know, you put your hand on his arm and said, Rick, you give us hope. Yes. And I think if there's a thought that I want to end on, you know, we have a, a, a country uh, that we're connected to that's over there about 6,000 miles away. It's called Israel. And when Israel was deciding what they should choose for a national anthem, they, choose, they chose something called Hatikva, which means hope. So after all we went through for 2,000 years, let's always <laughs> sing about hope. So after all we went through for how many years or how many yes. moments tonight, yeah. how many tough questions in conversation, we end on this notion of hope. Thank you for bringing us Mazel hope tov. this okay. evening. And thank you all for being here.